Thank you for standing by. My name is Parvilu and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Rexford Industrial Realty Inc. first quarter 2024 earnings call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press star one again. Thank you. I would now like to turn the conference over to David Lanzer, General Counsel. You may begin. We thank you for joining Rexford Investor's first quarter 2024 earnings conference call. In addition to the press release distributed yesterday after market close, we posted a supplemental package and investor presentation in the investor relations section on our website at rexfordindustrial.com. On today's call, management's remarks and answers to your questions may contain forward-looking statements as defined by federal securities laws. Forward-looking statements address matters that are subject to risks and uncertainties that may cause actual results to differ. For more information about these risk factors, please review our 10-K and other SEC filings. Rexford Industrial assumes no obligation to update any forward-looking statements in the future. In addition, certain financial information presented on this call represents non-GAAP financial measures. Our earnings release and supplemental package present GAAP reconciliations and an explanation of why such non-GAAP financial measures are useful to investors. Today's conference call is hosted by Rexford Industrial's Co-Chief Executive Officers, Michael Frankel and Howard Schlemmer, together with Chief Financial Officer, Laura Clark. They will make some prepared remarks, and then we will open the call for your questions. Now I will turn the call over to Michael. Thank you, David, and welcome everyone to Rexford Industrial's first quarter earnings call. I'll begin with a few remarks, followed by Howard, who will provide market and operational detail. Then Laura will provide our financial results and outlook. I'd like to begin by thanking our Rexford team for your strong results and another quarter marked by substantial value creation across the Rexford platform. On the leasing front, the team completed 3.2 million square feet of leasing activity at very favorable spreads as we continue to monetize the substantial mark-to-market for lease rates within our in-place portfolio. And notably, we extended our largest tenant, which Howard will detail shortly. On the investment front, our team completed over $1 billion of acquisitions, delivering substantial initial and longer-term accretion. Our activity included a large off-market portfolio purchase acquired from a combination of Blackstone-affiliated entities for approximately $1 billion, comprising over 3 million square feet of high-quality warehouse product focused within Premier, Los Angeles, and Orange County submarkets, with tenant sizes averaging 43,000 square feet. The transaction is notable for the high quality of assets and significant levels of cash flow accretion contributed to our portfolio. In 2024 alone, the portfolio is expected to contribute an incremental four cents of FFO per share net of funding cost, along with an estimated 25 to 50 basis point increase in operating margin. Additional growth over time will be driven by some value add improvements, as well as the 3.9% embedded average annual rent increases within the portfolio. The investment was also unique as it was the result of an off-market collaboration between the Rexford and Blackstone teams. We worked together to curate the portfolio by selecting assets to optimize the blend of quality, return on investment, and accretion to our business. The transaction is a testament to the benefits associated with working principle to principle to drive a superior outcome for both parties. The transaction is also indicative of a range of portfolios that we continue to track which may be catalyzed from time to time by potential seller or market circumstances. With regard to market conditions, we are seeing some current choppiness, particularly within certain submarkets and size ranges. We expect some ongoing relative volatility within our markets through the near term, principally driven by heightened uncertainty in the interest rate environment, exacerbated by the current global geopolitical unrest. However, despite some relative market uncertainty, we believe our infill Southern California industrial tenant base will continue to prove itself by demonstrating the nation's strongest tenant and supply demand fundamentals over time. Although we can't predict how our market may perform into future periods, so far, 
we are seeing a distinct and accelerating differentiation between the stronger relative performance of our infill SoCal portfolio, whether measured by net absorption, change in rents, or related metrics, as compared to the relative performance of larger products sized over 200,000 square feet, primarily located in non-infill big box markets, such as the Inland Empire. Big box, larger space, is typically part of a super regional or global logistics network, where space needs are relatively fungible across locations, and where demand for any single space can be highly elastic and reactive to short-term demand drivers. In contrast, our smaller infill tenants are generally serving the nation's largest first and last mile of distribution, focused on regional consumption within the nation's largest and most diverse regional economy, where performance through cycles has tended to be more durable. Big box markets such as the Inland Empire are also subject to volatility driven by substantial increases in new supply impacting occupancy through cycles. As compared to our high barrier infill market, which is subject to an ongoing scarcity of supply with a virtually incurable supply-demand imbalance over the long term. Consequently, and as we've observed through prior cycles, our Rexford tenant base, which averages 26,000 square feet in size and is 100% located within prime high-barrier infill SoCal markets, is outperforming the big box market and product type. Looking forward, the growth opportunity embedded within our existing portfolio continues to be substantial. Over just the next three years, we expect cash NOI to increase by $282 million, or 47%, growing to $876 million in total NOI. Importantly, this assumes today's rents and no future acquisitions, and is comprised of $94 million of incremental NOI related to repositioning and redevelopments stabilizing over the next three years, $88 million from the conversion of below market leases to market rents, assuming today's rents and no future market rent growth, $58 million related to acquisitions closed year-to-date, and $42 million from the 3.6% embedded contractual rent steps within our current portfolio. We continue to be positioned to execute upon our expected 11% to 13% three-year average annual core FFO per share growth through 2026, which assumes no future acquisitions. Please note that we plan to update our long-term core FFO per share growth forecast on an annual basis at the beginning of the year. With that, I'd like to thank the Rexford team once again for your tremendous dedication and results, and I'm pleased to turn the call over to Howard. Thank you, Michael, and thank you all for joining us today. Rexford began the year with strong execution across our value creation initiatives. During the first quarter, our team completed a very strong 3.2 million square feet of leasing by executing on the increased tenant activity we experienced during the first quarter, driving 140,000 square feet of positive net absorption. Notably, we extended Tireco, our largest tenant, occupying 1.1 million square feet into 2027. During the quarter, Tireco's in-place rent increased by 4%, which was carried forward. The extension includes a 4% bump in year two and a two-month rent concession. With this lease execution, we de-risked our largest near-term lease expiration, securing favorable and growing cash flow for the next three years. Excluding the tire co-extension, leasing spreads in the quarter were 53% and 34% on a net effective and cash basis, respectively, and were in line with our expectations. Concessions increased nominally from a weighted average 1.2 to 1.4 months sequentially. Additionally, annual embedded rent steps averaged 4% for the first quarter executed leases, continuing to demonstrate our diverse tenant base's ability to pay higher rent in future periods. Within our portfolio, with an average space size of 26,000 square feet, we observed market rent growth that was flat sequentially and approximately negative 2% year over year for highly functional product comparable in quality to our expert assets. As we have communicated, particularly with respect to select submarkets and size ranges, we expect to continue seeing some near-term fluctuations in market rents. However, as demonstrated by the leasing activity within our portfolio and what we are seeing on the ground today, Tenants are evidencing their comfort with today's rent levels, plus 4% embedded annual rent steps. 
According to CBRE, vacancy in the infill markets increased 45 basis points sequentially to 3.2%. Notably, Rexford's portfolio continues to outperform the market due to our superior quality and functionality. By way of example, Rexford's first quarter net absorption was positive 30 basis points in contrast to the overall market's negative 20 basis points of net absorption. In analyzing net absorption in the market, similar to prior quarters, nearly 80% of buildings that contributed to negative absorption were of lower quality, dysfunctional, or obsolete, and generally not competitive with Rexford's portfolio. In stark contrast to the market, Rexford's strong new and renewal activity in the quarter drove an exceptional retention plus backfill rate of 87%. We continue to see relatively healthy tenant interest for our higher quality product with activity on approximately 85% of our vacant spaces. Turning to Rexford's investment activity during the quarter, we completed $1.1 billion of investments across 3.2 million square feet through off-market transactions. Subsequent quarter end, we closed one stabilized transaction for $27 million at a 5.5% initial unleveraged yield. Additionally, we have $275 million of pipeline acquisitions under contract or accepted offer, which are subject to customary closing conditions. The near-term pipeline investments, coupled with our year-to-date activity, are projected to generate an aggregate initial yield of 5%, growing to a 5.7% unleveraged stabilized yield on total cost. Moving to our acquisition and capital recycling program, subsequent to quarter end, we disposed of one property for $10 million, generating a 13% unlevered IRR. In addition, we have approximately $50 million of dispositions currently under contract or accepted offer, which are subject to customary closing conditions. Regarding our repositioning and redevelopment activity, During the quarter, we stabilized and leased approximately 40,000 square feet of repositioned property in central San Diego, achieving an aggregate 10.8% unlevered stabilized yield on total investment. Looking forward, we have 4.6 million square feet of value-add repositioning and redevelopments in process or projected to start within the next 18 months, with the remaining incremental spend of approximately $410 million which we expect to deliver an aggregate unlevered stabilized yield on total investment of 6.2%. Finally, I'd like to thank our Rexford team for their innovation and collaboration, driving another strong quarter of results. Now I'm pleased to turn the call over to Laura. Thank you, Howard, and thanks to the Rexford team for your market-leading efforts that drive our strong near- and long-term value creation. First quarter core FFO per share increased a strong 12% over the prior year quarter to 58 cents per share and was in line with our expectations. Same property NOI growth was 8.5% and 5.5% on a cash and net effective basis respectively. Leasing spreads over the trailing 12-month period of 71% on a net effective basis and 52% on a cash basis drove strong rental income growth. Turning to the balance sheet and capital markets activities, this quarter we opportunistically leveraged the balance sheet to fund accretive external as well as internal growth opportunities, including funding incremental spend of $455 million related to the near-term pipeline of repositionings and redevelopments that are projected to generate an incremental return of approximately 15%. At quarter end, net debt to EBITDA was 4.6 times and we anticipate that embedded internal growth alone will reduce leverage to within our target four to four and a half times range in the near term. During the quarter, we executed on a number of capital markets transactions. We completed the issuance of 1.15 billion of three and five year exchangeable notes at an average coupon of 4.25% and a 30% conversion premium. Let me pause here and take a few minutes to describe the mechanics of these exchangeable notes, also known as converts. Recent changes in accounting rules, combined with the ability to issue converts under the net share settlement method, known as instrument C, have created a unique opportunity and an additional attractive capital source. Under the net share settlement method, the par value of the convert, which in this case is $1.15 billion in aggregate, 
is treated like a bond, whereby Rexford will pay the par value in cash at maturity. Regarding the conversion premium, if Rexford's share price at maturity is 30% or more than the price on the date of issuance, the excess conversion value over par is settled at maturity in cash, shares, or a combination of the two at Rexford's option. This provides us with maximum flexibility at any future point in the capital markets cycle. The accounting for converts has also been substantially simplified. On the income statement, the coupon, which averages 4.25% for our issuance, is reflected as interest expense. In regard to the share count, only the net shares equivalent to the excess conversion value are added to the share count if and when the stock is trading above the conversion price. Importantly, the par value of the convert has no impact to share count as it is always settled in cash. Under this structure and with the accounting rule changes, there is no immediate dilution upon issuance and any potential future dilution is mitigated through the net share settlement mechanics as well as the flexibility for Rexford to settle any excess share value above the 30% conversion premium in cash or shares in the future. Continuing with our first quarter activities and concurrent with the exchangeable note offerings, we completed a public offering of 17.1 million shares of common stock to an existing long-only investor based on the West Coast, subject to forward equity sale agreements for a gross offering value of $841 million. And during the quarter, we settled the remaining forward equity sale agreements related to prior offerings for net proceeds of $290 million. We currently maintain substantial liquidity of $2 billion, comprised of $837 million of net forward equity remaining for settlement, $185 million of cash on hand, full availability under our $1 billion revolver, as well as expected proceeds from our capital recycling program as we harvest value through disposition. Finally, we have no material debt maturities until 2026, inclusive of extension options. Moving to full year guidance. As a result of the positive contribution from our first quarter investment activity, we are increasing full year 2024 core FFO per share guidance to a range of $2.31 to $2.34, up four cents at the midpoint when compared to our prior guidance. Please note that our 2024 guidance range does not include acquisitions, dispositions, or related balance sheet activities that have not yet closed. In regard to our same property guidance, our forecast assumes a range of expectations and is based upon the market dynamics we are observing today including leasing activity and demand, current supply, and the overall health of our tenant base. To the extent circumstances or markets deteriorate beyond the current levels we are experiencing today, we will update guidance accordingly. Our 2024 cash, same property, and OI guidance remains unchanged and is projected to be in the range of 7 to 8%. Net effective 2024 same property and OI guidance has been increased to 4.25 to 5.25%, up from 4 to 5%, driven by the strong level of early renewal activity in the quarter that generates higher straight-line rental revenue. Components of our projected same property guidance remain unchanged and include full-year average same property occupancy in the range of 96.5 to 97%, which is primarily driven by lease timing and average downtime cash leasing spreads of approximately 50% and net effective spreads of approximately 60%, excluding the impact of the aforementioned prior to lease extension. Note that leasing spread guidance incorporates current market rents and leasing spreads quarter to quarter are impacted by the mix of leases we expect to execute. Bad debt as a percentage of revenue is expected to be in the 40 to 50 basis point range and in line with pre-pandemic levels and average concessions in the one and a half month area. Thanks again to the Rexford team for your outstanding work that differentiates our business and enables our ongoing success. We now welcome your questions. Operator?
Thank you. The floor is now open for questions. If you have dialed in and would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad to raise your hand and join the queue. If you would like to withdraw your question, simply press star 1 again. If you are called upon to ask your question and are listening by a loudspeaker on your device, please pick up your handset and ensure that your phone is not on mute when asking your question. Again, press star 1 to join the queue. And your first question comes from the line of Blaine Heck with Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Uh, great, thanks. Good morning. Um, so one of your peers gave incrementally negative view on the timing of a rebound in, in activity in Southern California, but it seems as though your outlook is, is pretty consistent with your initial views. Uh, Michael, you gave some color earlier, which was really helpful, but can you just talk a little bit more about what might be driving that disparity, whether it be more conservatism in, in your initial view, uh, just different size segments and or different sub-market exposure? Hey, Blaine, thanks so much for joining us today. I appreciate the question. And it's an important question um, because I don't think it's just about Rexford having been maybe a little more or less conservative on a relative basis and setting expectations. I think the answer really gets more to the fundamentals of our market and the fact that the fundamentals, fundamentals surrounding the, the infill markets, where the average tenant size, for example, in our portfolio is under 30,000 square feet, are very, very different than the fundamentals that often drive the larger space, 200,000 square foot or larger space markets, which tend to be more in non info markets like the Inland Empire. And I think that's really where we get to the crux of it. And it really also gets to the fact, you know, there's so many reasons that, that we designed this business to focus exclusively on infill Southern California. It is a truly differentiated market with its own drivers. And as I mentioned, you know, our tenant base in the infill markets are disproportionately serving regional consumption. Uh, it's the largest first and last mile zone of distribution and the largest regional economy in the country. And, um, you know, that's really the, the fundamental difference. You know, the big box market is driven by super regional global trade flows. Uh, global demand drivers tend to have a bigger impact on that. I think the greatest real world case study and example probably came during the great financial crisis. Uh, and actually, we had a, a, a dramatic drop in demand globally. But if you saw the way the big box market performed relative to the smaller tenant base like Rexford's was dramatic. For instance, at that time in the Eastern Land Empire, vacancy doubled, tripled, or worse, depending on the submarket. And vacancy was actually relative, and occupancy was actually relatively stable within our infill markets. And that was during the worst of times, nothing like today. Um, so I think that, that, that that's really the key driver in, in differentiation in terms of performance. And then you layer on the fact that within our info markets, Rexford, our mandate is to deliver the highest functional, best locations, highest quality product within our submarket. So even within a submarket and an info market that's going to outperform through cycles, the big box market, within our markets, we should see differentiated positive performance by Rexford, you know, within the submarket. Um, so there's a lot to it. I think we've observed it through cycles, through many cycles. I think the data is pretty clear. Uh, you can go back almost 11 years and look at our disclosures when we went public. Uh, we tracked it then. Um, so I, I think it's fairly consistent and supported by the data out there. Um, and additionally, I think we try to take a, 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 we do try to be conservative in how we look forward, and we try not to prognosticate about what may happen in the future. And that's why our, our, our guidance and, and um, our thoughts on the future really don't incorporate market rank growth and things like that. Great, very helpful, Michael. Um, second question, uh, last quarter, I believe you talked about an expectation for 40% cash rent spreads in 2024. Uh, your spreads this quarter were 33.6, excluding Tyrico. And I think uh, you just mentioned, Laura, that the goal is now 50%, but correct me if I misheard that. So just wondering if you guys can comment on what might be, you know, be giving you confidence in higher spreads in the second through fourth quarters. Yeah, Blaine. Um, just to clarify, our, our cash same property guidance for the full year is 50%, and that's in line with our expectations that we set last quarter. Um, our net effective guidance for the full year is 60%, and also in line with expectations that we set last quarter, excluding Tyreco. So all that being said, um, as you know, spreads in any given quarter um, can vary dependent upon the leases that are rolling and, and the leases that are executed in that quarter. Um, this quarter spreads came in right in line with our expectations for the leases that we expected to sign. As we look forward, we're trading um, paper on a number of new and renewals uh, that give us comfort that we will be able to achieve our expectations around leasing spreads for the full year. 
Great. Thank you all. Your next question comes from the line of Camille Bonnell with Bank of America. Good morning. I have a few questions about your investment strategy. While the cost of capital you raised allows you to transact creatively, how do you balance deploying this capital in a market when rents continue to decline and there's risk to underwriting? Hey, Camille. Thanks so much for joining us today, and thank you for the question. So the key focus around our investment strategy is about value creation and the ability to overcome whatever cost of capital may be. In fact, we take a steady state look at our cost of capital, uh, which means when capital was very inexpensive, we didn't underwrite that in our investment strategy. And the key to our investment strategy is are we identifying opportunities to create value that overcome that cost of capital hurdle, if you will, and create value over the medium to long term. And that is the greatest differentiator of our, of our business, frankly, because even in an environment, to your question, where you may have nominal or even declining market rents, our investment strategy focused on value creation, where we're increasing the inherent cash flow generating capability of these assets with zero, or even in some cases, declining market rent growth, is truly unique and powerful. And I think that's where you're going to, the, the more that markets stabilize or the more that you see markets overall decline, the more Rexer is going to differentiate itself because we're going to continue to do the work, increasing the inherent cash flow generating capability of these properties through the renovations and modernizations that enable us to increase cash flow with zero or even declining market rent growth. Got it. And I understand at different points of your ownership, you'll update the business plan. So if we look through to the Tire Co. lease extension, an option you've created in 2027, are there levers you can pull or how confident are you in being able to position this asset so it performs in line or better than your initial right underwriting? Yeah, hi Camille, it's, uh, it's Howard. Um, well, first of all, you know, the tire co extension was, was done just after we increased rent 4% under the existing lease. So uh, that option they had had a fixed increase and so we, we really only gave up a 4% initial bump, which we pick up again uh, in, an, in another year under the lease. So uh, we're, we're pretty happy with uh, that outcome. The lease also has a five-year option in it, so that we're at, the option's at fair market value. So uh, we're able to reset uh, at the expiration to uh, a market uh, uh, rent uh, in 2020. Uh, which, from you know what what we see in the marketplace, there would be substantially less uh, deliveries uh, and competing product. Even looking into expirations that could occur within the marketplace and any product that could come to market. Uh, so from from our window, it looks like a much better time to be addressing that lease. Uh, and and so we've left the window open actually to reset uh, and continue the performance of, of the asset. Appreciate the added color there. And you've built a lot, a lot of excess capital and closed the quarter with quite an elevated level of cash. So can you shed a bit more light on how you're thinking about the cash balance this year and what's been assumed in guidance? Yeah, Camille, thanks, uh, thanks for your question. In terms of, um, in terms of our cash and, and liquidity as we sit today, um, we currently have about $2.1 billion of liquidity. That does include our $1 billion revolver. Um, on top of that, uh, in, included in the $2.1 billion is also um, $837 million of Ford equity remaining for settlement, as well as $185 million of cash on hand. So when we look at the uses of that capital, we have about $275 million of acquisitions that are in the pipeline um, under accepted offer. Um, and then, or under contract, we also have about $250 million of capital um, to spend just this year on our repositioning and redevelopments that are in process. So that leaves us with, um, with substantial um, liquidity of about $600 million on top of the revolve, um, with the revolver. Uh, and, and really, when we're thinking about, you know, other sources of, I mean, other uses of capital, we are going to continue to be very selective in terms of investing and, and driving and, and executing our, our investment strategy to find those opportunities that we can drive value creation, not just today, but over, but into the future on an accretive basis. Thank you. Next 
question comes from the line of Gregory McGuinness with Scotia Bank. Hey, good afternoon. Um, I guess uh, based on the data that you guys have sent, uh, showed us market rents held steady quarter over quarter, down a little bit year over year, but what about on net effect of rents? Have you guys been seeing any increase in free rent or other concessions? And also, how are you determining uh, market rent for the Rexford comparable portfolio? Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll jump in here. Um, thanks, Greg, so much for joining us today. Um, in terms of concessions, um, as, as you can see, I mean, our, our concessions this quarter were 1.4 months, excluding the tire co-lease. Um, our guidance for the full year is 1.5 months. Um, I'll note that you know that's consistent with the guidance that we uh, that we had last quarter, um, and concessions we have estimated um, as we did at the beginning of this year to increase from one month on average in 2023, and really that's what we think is more consistent with the normalized market in which we're operating in. Um, if you look back to the you know pre-pandemic years 2018-2019, we're we're assuming concessions more in line with those markets. Uh, when you look at our our average. Um, our average concessions guidance, it includes um, new and concessions on new and renewal leases. And so when you look at you know, our activity just this quarter, 75% of our activity was renewals that have lower concessions. Concessions on renewals this quarter were 1.2 months compared to 2.1 months on our new leases. So that's certainly driving the average concessions of one and a half months for the entire portfolio that we're projecting for the full year. In terms of concessions, it certainly varies. It varies by sub market, it varies by size across the markets, and certainly varies, as I mentioned, between new and renewal leases. In terms of your second question around how we determine um, market rents and market rent growth within our portfolio, we, uh, our team does an incredible job every single quarter. Um, thank you so much to the team, by the way, that's I'm sure on the call listening. Uh, but they do an incredible job every quarter. Um, Bottoms-up analysis, we have over 1,600 spaces within our portfolio, and we apply a market rent to each space quarterly. And that market rent is the, the rent that we believe that we would lease that space at today. And then we compare that rent back to the prior quarter and the market rent that we thought that we could lease the space at in the prior quarter. And that's how we determine market rent growth for our portfolio. Okay. Um, and then I guess at the end of last year, it seemed like there was a greater openness to utilizing dispositions to fund investment activities. Did you end up taking any steps to test the market? Uh, and what were you seeing on cap rates? Uh, and did that maybe kind of push you to sticking with equity funding and the convert instead of asset sales? Yeah, hi. No, actually, we have increased activity on dispositions this year. Uh, we announced a $10 million sale with a $50 million of dispositions either under contract um, or accepted offer. And uh, so we're actually providing more transparency this year on, on some increase in activity this year, actually. Um, and maybe, maybe to your, your point or question, maybe reflected uh, to the perception, at least earlier this year, uh, that we were in a more stable interest rate environment. Yeah. And, I'll, and I'll just add to Michael's comment that uh, disposition we completed for $10 million, the uh, in-place cap rate was 4.2%. Okay, but it's not. But I guess there's not really any expectation that dispositions will become a meaningful part of the uh, you know, capital structure in terms of how you're uh, raising funds for acquisitions or for the repositioning redevelopment portfolio spend. Well, it depends how you define meaningful, but um, we think it's a very important part of our strategy, it's a very important source of accretive capital, and uh, so it really depends how you would define uh, and that uh, meaningful. And that's why we also provide a little additional disclosure on the immediate pipeline uh, to give folks a, a better sense of where the activity is. Okay, thank you. Your next question comes from the line of John Kim with BMO Capital Market. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about the pricing of your off-market transaction with Blackstone. <clears throat> the 4.7 initial cap rate seems a little tight, just given the limited mark-to-market. It was accretive to you, I, I realized, uh, based on your cost of capital, but a lot of your competitors don't have that cost of capital. So I was wondering how you came up with, with that pricing and where you think this would go out in the, in the open market. 
Yeah, hi, hi, John. It's Howard. Um, well, we're we're seeing transactions in terms of the current market. Of you know, there was one that just closed. That was you know, literally a three three. Uh, I think it was a two seven, with some vacancy growing to a five in in year two, uh, with some with obviously some some lease up risk in it. And there's quite a few other transactions under contract that when they close. I think they'll represent a little bit of um, cap rate compression, even to some of the uh, cap rates we've seen recently. But in terms of you know how we curated this portfolio, you know it, it was a balance between uh, finding high quality assets with with great functionality and location uh, that had some growth uh, w within them. And so you know the the initial yield of four seven growing to uh, the five six. Uh, you know, had the upside we were looking for. And frankly, it's interesting, you know, in the past, you probably uh, heard us talk about how we conservatively underwrite. Uh, the portfolio is actually uh, performing a little bit already. We've, uh, we've had some uh, renewals and some rents that we've been able to put in place that are already outperforming underwriting. Did you get a sense that if it didn't go to Rexford, then a similar pool of assets was gone to one of your public peers? Uh, not, not necessarily, because we really curated the portfolio directly with Blackstone. There, was, there wasn't a broker involved. And this was really building upon 10 years of, of relationship that, that we have with uh, Blackstone Principles, uh, where we've been you know, seeking to be able to transact with them. And it was a unique opportunity that came up. And it wasn't a scenario where they said, hey, we're bringing something to market. You want an early shot out of it. It, w it was really a collaboration here. So, no, it, it really wasn't, you know, something that would have just gone to somebody else. And, you know, frankly, if, if Blackstone had, in fact, decided to market this particular portfolio, uh, the marketplace right now in terms of you know, capital coming back to, to the market, we think, uh, would, have, would have transacted po possibly a little tighter even. And John, just to provide an additional perspective, you know, these are assets that we are very familiar with. We've been underwriting them, offering on them, and many of them long before Blackstone even owned them. So that gave us an inherent informational advantage uh, in terms of crafting the portfolio together with uh, Blackstone. Okay, I wanted to ask about your redevelopment and repositioning portfolio and the, the leasing interest that you have on uh, projects under redevelopment, and particularly some of the larger assets, including 500 DuPont Avenue, um, if there's strong demand or, or weaker demand for larger box redevs. Um, yeah. So, well, first of all, I just I just want to uh, frame you know how the market here functions. Mo most all of the assets in Southern California come to market generally on a speculative basis. Uh, you know, typically the you know there's not a lot of pre-leasing, but it does it does happen here and there. We we have many instances where we've pre-leased uh, some of the assets. Um, so you know we're on we're on the right path. There's nothing unusual about uh, our our repo redevelopment pipeline right now and uh, any of the activity on it. But that said, you know we we just completed the asset you were speaking to, the 275,000 feet in the Inland Empire West, uh, and we do have very good activity on it. We we actually have uh, two uh, parties we're trading paper with, and you know we're encouraged that we might exceed uh, the lease up uh, the lease up timeframes with uh, with something uh, in the very near future. Great, thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Craig Mailman with Citigroup. Hey guys. Um, to go back to the, the rent question, um, I understand the methodology. I guess it, if you guys kind of just brought it out to a sub-market level um, in aggregate versus maybe what CBRE kind of is reporting for the quarter, what's sort of the outperformance of your specific pool versus what you know some of the brokerage firms have put out there? And could you give us a sense of um, if that spread between where you guys are estimating your market rents are versus where kind of the market view of rents are, if that's held pretty steady in terms of, you know, your hit rate on accuracy versus the, you know, the, the bigger picture 
kind of view of the markets that we all kind of focus on and hear from the headlines. Yeah, I think it's a great question, Craig. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, and I think a couple things. One, the primary difference in how we report rents and versus what you're hearing in the market in general is that the market in general is fundamentally covering a different pool of assets. And I think consistently, to your, to your question, consistently through time, we've observed that around 80% of the negative net absorption driving those numbers in the market overall is generally driven by very much lower quality, lower functionality, even obsolete product. And you know, this is a, almost a two billion square foot market with over a billion square feet built well before 1980. Um, so that is the vast majority of the marketplace. Um, and then in terms of driving our performance, it's a function of the higher quality, higher functionality, better locations. And I think what's interesting is that each quarter we tend to give our view of market rents, which is also informed by our actual leasing activity. But what we've also found is that our actual leasing activity as we move forward has tended to exceed what we thought our rents were for our portfolio. So I think that the okay. answer to your question is we've been pretty accurate and pretty consistent. If anything, actually, and this might be a little counterintuitive, it doesn't necessarily predict the future, we've probably been underestimating very slightly for our portfolio. Okay, that, that's helpful. Um, and then as, as we think about the Blackstone portfolio you guys just purchased, could you just go through a little bit um, kind of the, the characteristics of it from a sub-market perspective, how much of it is kind of traditional industrial versus maybe uh, R&D, just any kind of deeper dive into kind of what, what it consists of? Sure. Hi, Craig. It's Howard. Um, well, first of all, as, as I mentioned in a previous comment, uh, we curated this portfolio with Blackstone. So it is right in the bullseye of the product that Rexford owns and operates in the, in the marketplace. And what I mean by that is it's all low finish, uh, highly functional industrial. Um, the product is primarily, you know, 70, uh, Percent of it was in the LA uh, markets. Thirty percent of it was in Orange County, and one minuscule thirty-three thousand foot building was in Chino, which is the Inland Empire West. So it is it is exactly where we want to own real estate, and it's the best performing markets uh, that we've seen through cycles. Um, so you know that said, the average size space uh, in that portfolio is forty-three thousand square feet. And if if you had done done some deep research on uh, deliveries to the market, what you'd find is that for decades, no one has been able to deliver space in those size ranges to the marketplace because the math doesn't work between land values, construction costs, and rents. And and so there's uh, huge barriers in terms of any uh, competition around that type of product, and especially when you get into the quality of the assets, you know, sort of back to Michael's comments about what really comes to the market in terms of uh, age and quality. Um, so, you know, and then looking at the portfolio, you know, leases that were in place were about 10% below market. In place, rent steps average 3.9%, and the weighted average lease term is 3.2 years. So uh, the, there's there's a near-term stabilization, which gets us up to that 5.6%, but we, you know, we're locking in 4% uh, escalators in these leases. Uh, so, you know, there's there's a great compounding effect. Uh, and then there's a little bit of value-add work here and there just to do some light modernization and uh, some, fun, you know, functional improvements, maybe a little bit of loading we can add and some fenced yard and so forth that'll add more value uh, in the future periods and potentially even more uh, value creation down the road. Great, and one one last one. Michael, I know you guys, um, you know, cost of capital, you, you, you try to find assets that are creative to that. And so it's not necessarily dependent on where your spot cost of capital is, but at these levels, um, would you be a buyer of assets here today at similar cap rates to what you just bought or if there's cap rate compression or would we expect to see Rexford kind of move to the sideline until your cost of equity improves? You know, we don't, don't give guidance on what we haven't closed yet, but I will tell you that we are going to focus on investment opportunities that we believe give lift to our cost, to our stock price that more than overcome the cost of capital 
uh, at the time that we're buying. Great, thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Nick Tillman with Baird. Hey, good morning out there. Maybe touching a little bit on just scrolling through your leasing activity over the last five quarters, around like 20 to 25% of leases expiring have been moved into repositioning or redevelopment. I guess looking into 24 and 25 expirations, are we expecting a similar level or is that just elevated from like the acquisition activity we saw in 21 and 22? Yeah, I mean, I think we talked a lot about last quarter, you know, the opportunities that we've um, within the portfolio to be able to execute on our value creation plans. And that comes, you know, at the point of acquisition where we set strategic plans around every single asset. And so last quarter, we moved a number of projects, we actually moved 10 projects into repositioning and redevelopment um, into the pipeline. And so we've looked, we, we try to look as far deep into the pipeline as possible and give you as much visibility as possible. And so we're incorporating projects that, that you know, we believe that there's a reasonable likelihood that we'll execute on a repositioning and redevelopment plan over the next 12 to 18 months. You'll also notice that we didn't move any additional projects into repositioning and redevelopment this quarter um, because we're giving you that forward look uh, and we included those properties last quarter. So what's in the disclosure is kind of what you've planned on, what you have visibility today. Uh, That's correct. Future. Over the, over the okay. next 12 to 18 months. Yep. Okay. And then, Laura, maybe just touching a little bit on, on bad debt in the quarter. You guys did call up a one specific tenant, uh, but then reaffirmed kind of the guide expectations for the year. So uh, just a little bit more color on that would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So our, our bad debt guidance for the full year is 40 to 50 basis points. Um, in line with pre-pandemic levels. Uh, our tenant health remains very stable. And when we look at our watch list, we, we have less than five tenants on our watch list and we have over 1,600 tenants within our portfolio. And that's remained very consistent in line with what we've seen the past um, 12 to 24 months. In terms of this quarter, we did see an increase in bad debt. It was isolated to a single tenant. Uh, importantly, that tenant was on our pre-watch list and that was already incorporated into guidance which is why you're not seeing us increase guidance. Um, so we feel good about where our bad debt expectations are for the full year. Um, currently, you know, for Q2 to Q4, that would imply bad debt uh, of about 30 basis points through the rest of the year. That's it for me, thank you. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Bikram Malhotra with Mizuho. Uh, thanks for reading the questions. Maybe just for fun, um, with the tire co extension, this deal uh, with Backstone, what does that do to sort of your three year outlook kind of to get to the 14 to 17 for the next two years that you sort of outlined last quarter? Um, no, no change in our, in our outlook as we communicated. Um, you know, this was within our expectations. So, so you're still expecting uh, 25 and 26 to be for FFO to be about 14 to 17%? Well, based on the math, again, going back to our, our, our forecast for the next three years, it's an average annual growth of 11 to 13%. This year, we're anticipating growth of 6% on an FFO per share basis at the midpoint. So that would imply, um, that would imply higher growth in 25 and 26. And importantly, that's being driven by the repositionings and redevelopments that we have in the pipeline or that are, in, or are projected to start and the delivery um, of those. Got it. Okay, that's helpful. Um, Laura, I think you, you gave us the gap mark to market of the portfolio. Do you mind just giving us where the cash mark to market is today? Yeah, the cash mark to market today is 33%. Um, that compares to 38% uh, at the end of fourth quarter. Uh, I'll give you... Um, the drivers of that, which I'm sure you'll find helpful. Uh, so that's a five percentage point change that's being driven by um, 100 points from um, leasing that we that we completed in the quarter, the conversion of the mark to market there. Um, as a note, that equated to $7 million of NOI annually um, that we've been able to capture through the conversion of mark to market just this quarter. Um, 100 basis point uh, impact from the any vacates within the portfolio. 100 basis point impact from um, contractual rent steps of 3.6%, which is our portfolio average, and then a 200 basis point impact from our first quarter acquisition. Okay, that's really helpful. And then just last one, I guess some of your peers have called out 
you know, CPL weakness in the broader sort of SoCal market. I know your markets are different, your boxes are different, but do um, you have a rough sense of whether these are larger 3PLs or maybe the smaller regional ones? What's the portfolio exposure to 3PLs? Hey, Vikram, thank you again so much for joining us today. It's Michael. And again, when we hear a peer mention 3PLs, they're talking about spaces larger than 200,000 square feet, actually averaging closer to three to 400,000 square feet. So it really is a different type of tenant base. And I think what we've seen within our infill markets is, yes, some, some movement among 3PLs, uh, but not really dramatic relative to other tenants and other sectors and other industries. It's been pretty balanced, both on the demand side, on a positive, and also to the, to the air side where there's been a negative absorption. So a little more balanced within our infill markets. You got it. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Nikita Belli with JP Morgan. Um, hang on. Are you aware of any other fixed renewal situations that are similar to Tyreco that you had in your portfolio maybe over the next 12 to 18 months? Uh, no material at this point. Uh, and regarding the demand, like where are you seeing most activity in terms of demand and maybe specifically which tenant category? Like what is What is driving most of the activity today? Well, I think that's the beauty of our markets and our tenant base. It's extremely diverse. And uh, I think the trend is that there's no strong single trend from a sector perspective, which is a great thing. It's one of the many reasons we focus on uh, infill industrial in Southern California and focusing on generic space, by the way, which enables us to appeal to the widest, deepest, broadest, and most diverse tenant base probably in the country, maybe the world. And uh, so the sources of demand are, are very, very diverse from aerospace, uh, electric vehicle sector, consumer products, uh, the building trades, uh, which we expect to, they've really shown um, some, some positive momentum. And by the way, you know, that's not surprising given the fact that California has a mandate to increase housing by at least 20%, representing over 1.5 million units of housing. And so that's actually, we, we think that's going to give us some great tailwinds in terms of demand for about the next 20 plus years. Um, so extremely diverse set of drivers. Actually, we had a lot of interest and in, in activity in terms of leasing activity from e-commerce driven tenants, which actually was elevated uh, this last quarter compared to prior quarters uh, in, a, in a notable way. Um, and that's not surprising, by the way, um, at all. We're still in the early stages of seeing the impacts of e-commerce uh, on our distribution market. Got it. That's great. Laura, can I ask you uh, one other question? I think at some point, correct me if I'm wrong, did you, you talked about maybe the mark-to-market on the portfolio for the future, like year-end 24, year-end 25. Is that something that you guys are willing or can provide at this point, the recalculation of what you think your mark-to-market on the entire portfolio will be over the next several quarters? Yeah, I mean, as as we've communicated, as we communicated last quarter that we're going to provide the mark to market as we see it um, each quarter, um, because as we know, the mark to market changes actually daily. Um, as we sign leases, um, we're resetting the mark to market and moving that and, and moving the mark to market into will will change on a on a quarterly and annual basis, dependent upon the leases that we sign. So we think that it's most helpful to provide you all with the visibility into the mark-to-market um, every quarter at a point in time. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Anthony Howe with Truist Securities. Hey guys, thanks for taking my question. Um, I noticed that you guys added 4 million, uh, 4 million square feet of assets into the 2024 sector pool, mostly in the Inland Empire West and LA County. And these assets appear to be under lease compared to the 2023 pool. I was curious if you can provide any color on these assets and maybe where do you think that the occupancy is going to be at a year end? Yeah, thanks, Anthony, for your question. In terms of um, in terms of the same store pool, yes, uh, we did add a number of assets into the same store pool. Um, there were a few assets uh, in that pool that have lease up opportunity. Um, we've actually signed a number of leases this quarter um, that will contribute to um, occupancy of about 50 basis points, actually, as we move through the year. Um, so we're excited about the prospects there um, and, the, and the prospects for opportunity for growth. Thanks. Again, if you would like to ask a question, press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. And our next question comes from the line of 
Vince Tiboni with Green Street. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, are you starting to see any distressed acquisition opportunities from spec developers in Inland Empire West? And yeah, you know, would you be willing to actually grow your footprint in IE and take on some leasing risk if if the price was right? Hi, Vince. Uh, it's Howard. Nice to hear your voice. Um, I've, I've heard a little bit, uh, but I haven't seen anything, you know, in in mass in terms of any type of trend like that. Um, as far as our appetite to take on larger, you can see in a market that has an of that product supply. Uh, the answer would be a simple no. It, it's not not an area that uh, we're putting any focus. Uh, you know, we're we're more interested if we're going to buy anything in, in that market uh, in the product that hasn't been delivered to market and is not really easily re uh, replicatable uh, in terms of the un the underwriting side of it. Got it. Makes sense. And then, kind of as a follow up to that, what do you think the stabilized cap rate spread is today between IE West and Infill LA? You know, adjusted for a similar lease mark to market. Um, it, it's hard. It's hard to say. But uh, you know, from some of the transactions that I think we're starting to see, or or product that we know is under contract, it's probably. Somewhere in the plus or minus 50 basis point range. Great, thank you. Thanks, Ben. That concludes our Q&A session. I will now turn the conference back over to the management team for closing remarks. Uh, thank you very much for joining Rexford Industrial on today's call. We look forward to reconnecting with you and wish you well for about the next three months. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect.